I am typically not an emotional person, but I've been very emotional this week. Um, so that's the Holy Spirit moving. Um, so you guys may have to bear with me while I cry through some of this, but that is okay. So before we get started, I want to pray. Heavenly Father, God, I just thank you for all of these women here. Lord, I know, I know what you have said and what you've placed on my heart, that there is someone here that is barely holding on, God, that they just do not know what's next for them. Lord, I pray today for the courage that as I share my testimony, you've said in Revelations, Lord, that the enemy is overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Yes. And I ask that you use my pain, Father, that you take my pain and the things that I've walked through and you set the captives free, God. Lord, use me, but nothing, I don't want to be anything but a vessel. Nothing but a vessel. Lord, I'm here, just use me and, and prepare the hearts just to receive what you have for them. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Okay, so it was really awesome. Stacy did John 5, and I was like, oh, that's what the Lord gave me. So um, I trust that. That is no coincidence. Like, somebody in here needs to hear it two times. Amen. So we're going to do it again. So we're in John 5, um, the man healed at the pool of Bethesda. So after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him laying there, he knew that he had already been in that condition a long time. He said to him, do you want to be made well? And that's my question for all of you guys today. Do you want to be made well? Because it is a choice. It is a choice. It's not something that we just, oh, like, our God, he's a gentleman. He stands at a door, and he knocks, and it is our choice to let him in. He's not going to come barging in our mess. He's not just going to come in and be like, here I am. I'm here to fix it all. We have to say, Lord, I want you to come meet me in my mess, and I surrender everything. So with that, I'm going to share my testimony, and this is the first time I've ever done this in um, a crowd. I mean, it's it's easy in a group, but it's a little different in front of you know this many women. So I grew up in um, an abusive home. Uh, my dad struggled with alcohol and drugs. He was very, very abusive. Mentally, physically, emotionally, he manipulated um, all of us. And I became the protector of my family. I would clean up my mom after he would hurt her, and I would hide my brother, who was four years younger than me. And that was just my job. It was just something I picked up. Something I decided, you know, this is, this is just what we're going to do. We just want to keep everybody safe. I didn't know who God was. I didn't grow up in a home where there was God. Um, my mom would occasionally say, like, the Lord's Prayer, and I was like, okay. And then everyone would talk about my papa, who had went to heaven. And they told me that that was, like, a really fantastic place. Um, and so I used to cry <coughs> out to him. Sometimes to come save me. Because that's I I knew I knew somewhere that somebody heard me and somebody cared. It 
there was this old, um, some of you probably know, 90s, I think it was 90s country song talking about the little girl that hid behind the couch. And she's like, I don't know your name, but I think you were there. That man that was on the cross, and that was my song. I knew, I knew he was there. I knew he was. So I used to pray continually that someone would save us. At 11, I was sexually molested for the first time. It's at this point that I accepted the identity that this was how you got people to love you, that this is how you got the abuse to stop, that this is how, this is how you make people happy, right? And I accepted that. Well, this is my purpose. This is what I'm gonna do. My body makes people feel better. In middle school, I found Jesus. Um, I have a huge passion for our youth, for our middle school and high school kids, because God, they need so much love. They do so many things alone, and they are hurting. And so many of us know these, these paths of abuse and these cycles and this generational bondage. And just the fact that we can speak to these young kids and we say, well, you don't have to pick this up. You don't have to carry this the rest of your life. You don't have to live in the dysfunction that your parents never got through. And we should be supporting our youth. We should be supporting our kids. In church, for me, like I found Jesus because some church opened up a safe place for me. That's why I went. They had food, and they had doors open. And that meant I didn't spend as much time at my house. That meant I got a break from being the protector. So it also gave me a place of, of safety, and it validated that someone was there. All those years when I didn't know that, you know, who God was or that he loved me, he was there listening. There was somebody. It wasn't my pap all up in heaven, but it was my Lord and Savior. Yes. My junior year in high school, um, my dad was arrested for choking me. See, my mom was a habitual returner. She grew up in a cycle of abuse. She didn't know any different. She didn't. She was treated the same way. So as many times as her heart would break and I would watch her and we would, we would sneak away and we would sleep overnight in some truck stop to, to escape my dad, she would return. And no words were ever said. Nobody said, I'm sorry. Nobody said, hey, this shouldn't happen. Nobody said anything. We just returned. But he couldn't get out of it this time. The cops were called. He was arrested. Um, and in order for, for my mom to keep my brother and I, uh, she had to leave. And it was the happiest two years of my life. I wasn't a normal teenager. I worked two jobs. So I could put groceries in the fridge with my mother, who also worked two jobs. You know, I, I didn't... I didn't have time to do the things or make the stupid mistakes that kids make in high school. But it was okay. I was so full of joy and happiness because for the first time, I felt safe. So, I went to college. Um, I made this decision to go to college. Actually, uh, I would say that before I made this decision to go to college, um, I had been accepted. I used to play softball, and I was really, really good at it. And I was accepted to some major universities um, with softball scholarships. And um, my dad had come back in the picture, and he was on drugs, he was on alcohol, and I became bitter, and I became very rebellious. My dad always wanted me to do softball. That was his thing. He wanted me to be good. He wanted me to do all these things. And I, some, something in my brain was like, we don't need to do this anymore for him. Like, we don't have to do this. We're just going to go crazy, just a little bit. Um, so I chose some little tiny school in Oklahoma that nobody had ever heard of. And I was like, well, I'm going to do this just to make everybody angry. 
and uh, it ended up, that's where I found my husband, so it was a great decision on my part, um, but I get a call uh, a few months into school uh, that, you know, my dad's moved back in. My brother's very angry at this point because I've practically been his mother. I've practically been taking care of him his entire life. Um, so he's like, you just left me. You left me. And I'm like, I did. But I had to do my own thing. But I wasn't doing good things. Um, I went to college, and when I found out my mom had moved my dad back in, I fell into this serious cycle of rebellion. I'm talking partying, drugs, alcohol, sleeping with whoever, because that's how people love you. Yeah. Remember, like, um, that's how you make people happy. And I've always really struggled with my worth and my value. So, that is how I met my wonderful husband, Seth. So, Seth, <laughs> um, one day I get this call, hey, I'm at the hospital, I overdosed on drugs. Oh, I'm a really good fixer. Like, I'm really good at that. I know drugs. Like, I, I know how to help those people. Like, let me <coughs> fix you. And so I met Seth, um, and I started my cycle of fixing, which was really great. Um, Seth was comfortable. He was comfortable. Um, I used my body to help him feel better. I used, um, I uh, put myself aside and whatever it took, I did that for this man because I did love him so much. During this time, uh, we had decided that college wasn't working for Seth. Um, he was either gonna end up in jail or um, become a police officer or join the military. So that's what happened. Um, two years later, we were married, stationed in Alaska. And I'm from Texas. It is so cold in Alaska. Like when your boogers freeze on your face, it's too much for me. I can't do it. Um, so we moved to Alaska in September. And in January, he left for Afghanistan for over a year. I was pregnant with our first child. Um, doing it all by myself. I had this baby alone. Um, in January of 2010 was his uh, welcome home ceremony from Afghanistan. This was the first of four deployments that he would do, multiple, multiple of them being combat. There's this picture of me at a welcome home ceremony, holding this baby. And I just wanted him to be so proud of me and what I had done while he was gone. And the look on my face is pure joy. Pure joy. Because I can't wait to welcome home this man that left me a year ago to go serve his country. That was the last bit of joy I felt for over 13 years. I did not know um, combat PTSD. He was injured in Afghanistan. He, um, he received a traumatic brain injury. Um, and the man that came home was so completely different than the man who had left. And when I say that, I mean you could look in his eyes and they're just dark. He was lost and I couldn't save him. This was something I didn't know. I, didn't, I, I could do drugs, I could do alcohol, I could do addiction, but I couldn't do this. This was scary, this was uncomfortable, this was hard. 
I spent the next 13 years on suicide watch consistently, hiding knives in the back of, a, of the wheel well, well of our car so he would hurt himself if I had to go to the store. Um, the army was no help. They just were like, ah, you're going to Iraq now. Oh, now you're going here. Um, during this time, we had you know, multiple more deployments and two more kids. Uh, we moved to six different states. I was clinging so hard to the Lord in survival mode. I prayed and I prayed, but I was bitter. I became so bitter. You know why? Because I had never dealt with all the pain from my childhood. And he instantly reminded me of my dad. Someone hurting me, someone that was angry, someone full of rage. And I became an angry, not good person. <laughs> In the midst of my anger, pain, and confusion, I started taking out all of my pain that I had, and I locked it up in a backpack that I carried with me. Everything from childhood, I took out on this beautiful man that couldn't deserve it. He didn't ask for any of that, but I took it out on him because I never dealt with it. I became so hard towards him. After a little while, the Lord started working on me, starting with my childhood stuff, but at this point, he wasn't receptive. Does anyone ever feel like that? Does anyone ever feel like, okay, um, I start working on something and the timing is always too late, too early? But the timing, God's timing is perfect. Amen. Always perfect. I couldn't see that because I've always been a fixer. I've always been the protector. I've always tried to be in control. I kept trying to reel Seth into the Lord. If he could just find Jesus, if this could just happen, then everything's going to be okay, right? Like, I wanted healing for him. I wanted him to be okay. All while, I was neglecting myself. You see, so many times I become hopeless for myself and hopeful for those around me. I was the man on this mat. The man that laid there 38 years, tired, hopeless, weary. I believed fully in the word of God and that he could do it for everybody else. But it seemed like I had just accepted the fact that something in me just wasn't meant to be happy myself. Like I wasn't meant, <sighs> that's great. Our God is a God of miracles. He can do everything. But, you know, this is just my form. He just wants me to live like this. Yeah. I'll never get it. It's not my day. Nothing's going to change. The man at the pool wasn't even looking. Historically, they believed that there were hundreds, if not thousands of people there. But Jesus went to one man. Amen. The man had been afflicted so long that it was all he knew. He couldn't even remember what it was like before. I, too, was comfortable in my affliction. I grew up in trauma. I grew up in chaos. I didn't know that there was anything different. Chaos was my comfort. Peace? This last year, peace has been hard for me. It's hard to know what peace is. It's different. It's like, what is this? I don't know if I can do peace. Lord, it seems like this. You can't. The man couldn't muster up the strength to believe God and that anything could be different at all. He feels like he will never be the one to receive what he needs from God. I want to be made well, but it's impossible. The man had a combined hope with hopelessness. He had the mentality that the only way God could meet his needs was the way that he saw in his mind. Right? That's that's so true of all of us, right? There's been there's been a point in your life where it's like the only way that God can do this is if he makes this, 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 and this happen. We we place him in this box and we're like, this is the only way you can move. He wanted it done, but he wanted it done one way. The man had big hope that something could be done, 
He knew that he could be healed, all while having hopelessness that it would happen for him. How often do we believe that about our Creator? I 100% believe in the Word of God and everything He says about miracles and healing, but it's just not for me. It's not my time. You see, He says that He wants in the water, but what He really desired was healing. People say, I need more money, but what they really desire is provision. I used to say, I want my husband to live, but what I really wanted was safety. I wanted to feel safe. People want to feel provided for. They want to feel protected. They want to, they just want Jesus. So let me introduce you to him. Jesus says in verse 8, rise up and take your bed and walk. Amen. Do you not think that he realized this man was paralyzed? I mean, I would have been like, do you see my lips over? <laughs> like, you have me out here, but do you see I can't do what you're asking me to do? It's like Jesus, okay, you just don't know he's paralyzed, but he was asking him to do something that he couldn't do. I know God has asked me to do things at times where I already said, Lord, I can't do that. How many things are we just checking off our list where God wants to move us in a situation and we're saying, no, we're incapable. My first reaction would have been that I can't do that, but he had a choice. Just like all of you have a choice here today. It's the battle between fear and unbelief. Fear has consumed my life for so long. So long. This last year has taken our entire family into a year of healing. Um, and I remember the first time I met Priscilla and Pastor Keith, and they looked me in the eyes and they said, you are barely surviving. And that's the first time I ever thought about that. I was. I was trying to live so much for him and my kids that I was barely hanging on myself. Unbelief would say, I can't be healed unless I get into the water. But faith would say, God can heal me any way he wants to. Amen. Unbelief would say that I've carried this bed for 38 years. But faith would say, Jesus, come pick up this mat and carry it for me. Mm -hmm. Unbelief would say that nothing is ever going to change. But faith would say, Lauren, it is time for you to live. Stop worrying about everybody else. You're my daughter. I want you to live. Amen. Sometimes our expectations aren't met because God does it in a way that we aren't expecting. Yeah. We have to step out of the way, girls. That's right. We have to let him move. So this last year, God has rocked our world. God met my husband on a, on a hill a few years ago. Do you know why it took him going to a hill, I believe? He went to, to a retreat called Mighty Oaks. It's fantastic. But um, it's for combat vets with PTSD. It's because I couldn't go. That's why. He met him there because I couldn't go, because I am trying to be his God. And sometimes it takes me stepping out of the way and realizing that I don't have what it takes to get him to the cross. That's good. I don't have what it takes to get my kids to Jesus. I can raise them the right way all I want, but they have a choice just like we do. Amen. So he met my husband there. He needed, God needs me to step out of the way because I am not the savior to my husband. My parents who are still struggling or my kids. This last year, I let my arms down and I allowed God to start the healing process in my life. 
You see, for years I have believed his word and everything he said. But I wouldn't let God too close. I held him like this. Because I was so tired of being hurt by everybody around me. Everybody had hurt me. Everybody that's supposed to take care of me my whole life has hurt me. But I wasn't okay. My king and my father loved me because fear had gotten in the way. This past summer, I had the opportunity to go to the same retreat my husband attended, this time for spouses of combat vets. I didn't know what to expect, and I found myself on the other side, like, oh, I've been through inner healing and deliverance, like, I don't know what my purpose is here, I don't know, um, you know, like, there's no more night terrors in my home, there's um, no more suicide attempts, I was grateful, and I am grateful for all that the Lord has done for both of us and how far we've come. But I was reminded that he wanted to heal it all. I was sitting there looking at the same hill that my husband found Jesus on. And I said, Lord, why am I here? And he said these very words to me, do you want to get well? I had a choice. This wasn't on anybody else anymore. Yes, facts, I had been through things that I had zero control over. No control. The majority of my life I had been through those things. I have done things that I've had complete control over. I've been both the victim and the perpetrator of my life. I haven't had a choice the majority of my life, but I have one now. So I say all of this to say, do you want to get well? I had a choice. It was mine to make. Saying yes meant I couldn't control how things were. I couldn't control how being made well happened. This wasn't, do you want so-and-so to get well? Do you want your mom to get well? Do you want stuff to get well? What about your kids? This was me. This was about me and my father, me and my God. I didn't have a say in what sacrifices that took. And I still don't. But I'm at peace with that. I didn't have a say in what it would look like. I didn't get to decide, I want to be well, Lord, but this, this, and this. He gave me a yes or a no question. And that meant I had to say yes or no. It's one or the other. We can't straddle this line. I found myself asking, how do I move forward without letting trauma control my life anymore? It takes vulnerability, courage, hope, conviction, and grace. So that's my question for all of you here today. What is your mat? What is your mat that you've been inflicted on for 38 years? What is it right now that is holding you back? Because I know, I know when God speaks to me and he says, there's someone in here that is bound by chains and needs to hear the word of your testimony today to be set free. That I get up here with courage. And I tell you that I picked up my mat. And I decided no matter what, I was going to move forward. So I know someone in here today needs to pick up their mat too.